Go to the local shop and buy some laptops. Okay, if you have been hit by a meteor, that is the last thing you have to worry about. And we really do worry about a lot of things. As security practitioners, we find we're constantly running from one thing to the next. If it isn't, you know, an IT security problem, it's kinetic warfare. If it isn't kinetic warfare, it's a pandemic. And it's really a constant process. And the thing is, security practitioners don't get into this for the glamour. We get in this because it's a call. We find that we are called to do this. I am Canadian, sorry about that. And yes, it is contagious, so just to let you know that in advance, it does spread. <laughs> <laughs> so I do uh, identify myself as a hacker because I started out in my career doing pen tests and not all of them were exactly <laughs> sanctioned. I, I'm glad you like that. I, one, one time I did this slide and I got a very odd look from the people in the audience. It is really amazing how the world sees hackers in general. And a lot of that is because we have lost control of the narrative. We have really gotten away from that and you know, mainstream media has taken off with it and made it look like hackers means criminals. And that's the really unfortunate uh, side effect of not owning the narrative. And we have to do a better job of controlling that. Now I've done a lot of stuff. And I hate doing slides like this, but I realize it's a whole lot easier than me trying to spell out everything I've done over the course of my career. I've been in control systems, I've been in finance, I've been as a defense contractor, all sorts of different things. And it's absolutely amazing how there is a commonality from one industry vertical to the next. 
A lot of the problems that you'll have in Italy are the same problems you'll have in Singapore, the same problems you'll have in Canada. And it's amazing that we, as uh, having uh, security practitioners, our skill set can transfer from one thing to the next. Oh, yes, I work there now. <laughs> so when we're looking at this, we sometimes lose track of what this all means. I've been listening to amazing talks today about all these different security issues, all these different vulnerabilities and exploits and things like that. But what does it all mean? How's it all put together? We amongst ourselves are really good about talking about this, but how do we explain this to the wider audience? And my boss is, well, she is a character, uh, Wendy Neither. She put me up to this where she said, okay, here's this picture. She sent me this photo here, which you can't see entirely, but it's an airplane window, obviously. Um, and she said, okay, tell me where I am. Okay, so it begins. First of all, I knew where she had been giving a conference. I knew her home base. So I was able to puzzle out the likeliest route that she was on based on the time of day and when she sent this. She sent this while she was on the plane. And I was able to figure out that she was on this exact plane and I sent it to her. And she said, yep, that's the plane. I was like, okay, great. I thought I was done. She goes, no, no, tell me what seat I'm in. Okay, let's try this again. So I pulled up the manifest of the flight that she was on, thanks to the good folks at SeatGuru.com. They have all of those seats. And I went, okay, now based on where she was sitting, based on the wing, which you can't really see in the picture earlier, but you can actually see where the wing is, I was able to triangulate and puzzle out roughly where she was sitting in the plane. So I guessed 5A. And she's like, oh, so close. <laughs> This whole process took five minutes. So when we are defending organizations or when we're doing penetration testing, it's all about securing those environments. The attackers have a very easy job fundamentally, and we have a much more difficult job as defenders to try and protect our organizations. Now, one of the really interesting things is when we're protecting organizations, we don't always pay attention to the core fundamentals we tend to lose sight of it to chase after the next shiny thing. And I really equate this to when I got my first apartment back and um, it was a long, long time ago. And my roommate and I were sitting there and my parents drove away in the van and I grabbed a pair of scissors and I ran around the apartment. He looked at me and said, what in the hell are you doing? I'm expressing my freedom. He goes, what happened if you trip? I haven't really puzzled that one out. And unfortunately, in so many security practices over the years, I've really seen that same sort of mentality. As when we're defending the organization, we don't usually take the time to look at everything within the organization. Attackers are very good at getting into organizations, not because they're using some fancy zero day that they you know, spent a million dollars on or earned a million dollars for. It's usually low hanging fruit. It's usually something simple to get in. Like when we look at Xavier's talk earlier today, we see all the different things that he was highlighting where any virus companies weren't even highlighting that they were a problem. They were very trivial exercises to get into those organizations. And this leads me to feeling like this in a constant basis. Even now, I, I spent 20 years as a defender, now as a you know global roaming talking head, I still feel like this. I can't get away from this feeling. So as defenders, we have to look at how we're gonna do a better job of being resilient. Now, this is one of those things that drives me bonkers because this seems to be the new hotness of every security company on the street, my own included, where we're talking about security resilience. What does this actually mean? Well, it's about managing change, managing the security in your organization in a positive or negative road. And if you look at this list here, there's nothing here that's rocket science. There's nothing all that, but it's really about getting back to core fundamentals. The things that we should have been paying attention to 30 years ago seem to have drifted away over time. And we can, tend to lose, uh, <clears throat> we tend to lose sight of things along the way. Sorry, I'm getting dried out there. And one of those things being, of course, multi-factor authentication. Now, security by design uh, is something I put up there. I, I prefer security by default because we tend not to really approach it in that way. And if we can bake that into the environment in a way that makes sense for the business units that we have to support, the organizations we have, to, and the people that are using this stuff, we don't want to do security in a way that is going to be an, a negative, a detractor. It has to be an enabler. Now, 
I remember uh, one company I was working at a very long time ago, we did a penetration test, and when I say we, I had external contractors do it for me, and they presented the details. And the attackers were able to gain access to our organization rather easily. Uh, I was kind of disappointed about that, but it happens. And the CIO looked at me and he goes, that's okay, we trust it. We trust everyone that's inside the fire. This doesn't really work. This doesn't scale. We have to make sure that we're doing a better job of protecting organizations. We all like to try and be environmentally friendly, but unfortunately, password reuse doesn't qualify. This is one of the things that I saw too many times. In my previous company, I was there for five years, we would see attackers would breach websites, take all those credentials, and then replay them against hundreds of thousands of other websites looking for ways to increase their access to other organizations and your assets, your money, your Amazon account, whatever it happened to be. And we have to realize that a password is fundamentally no more than a house key. When you try it, when you leave your flat, when you leave your house to go to work, wherever you happen to be going, you lock your door to protect your stuff. Off you go. If you drop your key somewhere along the line and the attacker and somebody of a negative bent picks it up and says, oh, I know who this person is. They can gain access to your house and the house has no idea that the person coming through the door is not the person supposed to be there. Passwords are fundamentally the same thing and we have to be able to do a better job. Unfortunately, when we're born into this world, we default to trust. The, uh, the Canadian author Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called uh, Talking to Strangers and he discussed this at length, where that when we arrive in this world, we're looking for food, we're looking for shelter, we're looking for a way to belong. Unfortunately, the vast majority of us, not security people, the vast majority of us never lose that default trust. As a result, the criminal element preys upon this. And our security, what's the word I'm looking for? Our threat landscape has changed. We just spent X number of years, and it seems to be debatable depending on what part of the world you're in. We spent several years in a pandemic. Our threat paradigm changed. I had denial of service by cat in my home office. The little bugger figured out how to reset the APC in my office. So if I wasn't paying attention to him, all of a sudden he would disappear under the desk. I'm like, what are you doing? <sighs> all my systems dropped. And he now has figured out how to do that in the TV room upstairs. So when my wife and I are watching television, all of a sudden the TV goes off, he comes out and he sits there and he's all very proud of himself. These are not the attacks that we thought of before the pandemic. And that's just it, the, I mean, obviously being tongue in cheek, but the attacks have changed. So a lot of this is because of what I like to refer to as security debt. This is technological debt that has accumulated over time or by happenstance and interaction with other systems that has become a security exposure for an organization. And I have lived this in too many organizations over the years. 20 years as a defender, you see a lot of broken setups. The heart bleed was one of those things that where I saw this come through and this really broke my brain. This was an open source library that for those of you who don't know, this is a, a SSL library. An open source piece of software used by every website on the planet at the time, but there was only one and a half people that was maintaining this particular library. They weren't receiving much in the way of financing from any vendor or anything like that. And an error was introduced in the code, either by happenstance or by malice, I don't think we'll ever know that, that allowed for this attack to take place two years later. Now this is a very fully funded project, all the rest of it, but these are the kind of things where if we're not paying attention, we can then fall victim to over time. And a lot of the reason we get to where we are now is because we've accepted risks along the way. Security practices far too often say, oh, it's okay, we'll just accept the risk put it in a drawer and be on with it, thinking that everything's fine. The problem is, is that vulnerability or that issue remains. <coughs> Excuse me. Beige desktop, this is one of my favorites. In every organization I have ever worked at before I got into the vendor space, I went looking, we don't do this, thank God. Um, I would see a beige desktop. Now this beige desktop would either be on the production floor or under somebody's desk, but invariably it was running mission critical code written by an intern that had left the company five years earlier, there was no documentation, and they had no idea how to port it off there onto another server, and if they went down, we'd lose millions of dollars in said organization. This, I've been talking about this in CISO roundtables I've been doing now for three years, and this is always something that always gets them. Everybody at the table says, oh God, yes, that's us. Because they accepted the risk. 
And a lot of that problem occurs because project managers and various organizations will say, okay, this is the timeline, this is what we have to hit. And if we don't, they'll try to bypass security in order to deliver. This is one of those things that drives me bonkers because yes, they have timelines they have to hit, but by bypassing security, they're hoping they're gonna you know, save some time and then inadvertently introduce uh, security issues along the way. Because as security practitioners, we don't always understand what the priorities are for the business that we're protecting. And I have had issues with both externals and internals in the past where they just had no idea what that organization was doing. I was working for a power company many years ago. We had a vendor coming in and he was late and he's stuck in traffic. I understand that. And he called up and he started talking. He's like, oh yeah, I'll be there a couple blocks away. And he goes, oh, I'll just keep talking to you until I get in. I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he said, what is it that you guys do there? Okay, this is a vendor coming in to try and sell me his product and he has no idea that we keep the lights on for 80% of the province of Ontario and Canada. I thought that was a bit of a problem. And this is a systemic problem that I find in not only in the vendor side, but also internal to so many organizations where people come in and say, this is a huge vulnerability. In one company I was working at, we had this one issue where our IDS system kept lighting up on a various AIX problem. And this AIX problem was marked as high because the vendor said so. The CIO was upset, the senior management was upset, they called dry right me in, and they said, why are we still getting this issue? They said, because nobody turned off that alert, and they laughed. And I said, we don't have any AIX systems in our entire environment. Uh, frustrating. So you have to understand when you're protecting an organization, if you're doing pen testing, if you're doing defense, whatever it happens to be, all of these are part and parcel of defending an organization. All sorts of different vendors out there have different types of products. They're all like different hammers. You got red hammers, blue hammers, yellow hammers. They all have different functions, roughly the same in that they're security products, but they're all there to help you. But if you don't know what it is that you're trying to protect in your organization, you shouldn't be talking to a vendor until you clearly understand what the risk appetite for your organization is, what your requirements are, what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve to protect your organization and support the aspirations of the business. And this is a vendor telling you that. Make sure you do your homework before you talk to any of us, because we have tools we'll gladly sell you, but we don't want to sell you stuff that you're not going to use or not going to need. Oh, pardon me, I haven't talked in a while. <laughs> so who are the risk orders in the business? Going back to the project manager example earlier, this is one thing where I was working in one power company and we had a project manager who had been accepting the risks. And I looked at him, I said, you realize you have absolutely no authority to accept risk in the organization? Because of course I do, this is my project. But this particular risk affects the rest of the organization. Oh had never been communicated beyond this project manager who was a contractor, by the way. And this was one of those problems that exploded when we started going through and looked at the systemic problem of all these different projects, accepting risks, never communicating them upwards. So senior management had no idea of all these different exposures. So we have to look at ways that we can quantify, we can understand what the current security state is in our organizations and how we can improve it. Because if we don't address the risk over time, that increases. And unfortunately, I've seen it far too many times. Some system that was left idle, wasn't taken care of, and then the attackers were able to use that to break in. In one company, I had another pen test come in, and they were able to breach the entire organization in 14 minutes. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, I sat down with my coffee and my newspaper. That's what the long ago was. So I read my newspaper. 9.14, the phone rings. No. I pick it up, we're in. Great. They had, they weren't only in, they had every router, every switch, they had the active directory, they were currently reversing all the usernames and passwords in it. All because somebody had taken a polycom device that you usually see in a boardroom or what have you, and attached it to the internet. The reason they did that is because over the weekend they wanted to work on configuring it so they could deploy it on Monday. It just so happened that the Friday morning that they went out and plugged it in was exactly when the pen test started. The pen test team found this, were able to go through the web interface, turn on SSH, and oh yeah, the network was flat. 16,000 employees, flat network spanning the globe. 
it was only a matter of time before something bad was going to happen to us. And that, thankfully, it was somebody we were paying to check. And when we look at items like IoT, we realize that the compound costs are much higher. Because if we look at not only the consumer grade crop, but I spent nine years in control systems and very much to what Omar was talking about, he really undersold it. And I mean that in a nice way. It is so much worse than you. There is no such thing as air gap in control systems. I spent nine years and I heard that every time and every time I could demonstrate that no, it was not air gap. I saw a, uh, a SCADA system in Thailand that was tweeting. I saw a system in Japan that was connected to the internet because one of the techs wanted to watch a cricket match. And guess what? Yeah, doesn't work that way. We've got the standard identify, protect, detect, and respond, and we have to make sure that we're constantly going through and doing this. Because somewhere along the way, we've lost that focus as defenders. And then when something bad happens, we run around with our hair on fire, trying to put out the fire, not fully understanding how we got there, never taking the time to go back and retroactively look at how we ever got to that point. <laughs> Gotta take your breaks. <laughs> so one company I was working back in, let's say 2001 timeframe, we had this guy there. I, at the time, I was doing network security for the organization, and this guy was in InfoSec. And I referred to him jokingly as the flaming sword of justice. His whole mantra was, how are we going to fire everyone now? And I was like, why do you want to do that? He goes, because they're breaking the rules. Do they know what the rules are? Well, they should. It drove me bonkers, because this is a guy that was supposed to be protecting the organization, and he had lost sight of the fact that we were there to enable the business. He was more interested in punitive punishment for individuals who did something silly as going to see lolcats or something like that online. It's like, oh, one time somebody went to eBay, he lost his mind. It's like, this is not an issue for us. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is something I've seen in too many organizations over the years as a recurring problem. People that look at security as it's my way or the highway, not realizing we are there to enable the business, we are there to make sure things get to a better place. And when we hit down or hit, hit at um, staff and make them feel bad and take away, you know, vilify them basically, then they don't want to be part of it anymore. They become part of the problem because you've shamed them into not wanting to talk about things. And you want them to communicate within the, in within the industry, within the business, what they see when they have a security problem. I have worked in organizations in the past where we would reward staff when they found a security issue and send an email to us. And what we do is we send an email to them and to their boss saying, congratulations, we found this. Um, and you know, thank you for highlighting it. And they would use this as currency to manage their next raise and things to that effect. So we had enabled them and empowered them to be part of the solution. Because this flaming sword of justice approach is dated, ineffective, and honestly, it just doesn't work. When we're looking at our environments, we realize that there are all sorts of different ways in. You know, the idea of the castle and the moat just is a broken uh, notion, especially when you look at there's just a myriad of ways to get in. You know, getting into a control system is one thing, getting into a bank is another thing. And I've had organizations say, well, how would you hack us? And I said, well, quite simple. I would take the CEO's admin out for lunch. And they looked at me like I was completely lost my mind. I said, you hadn't thought of that, had you? Well, no, we thought you were gonna try and pop a shell and, and stop right there. The hackers, the hackers, sorry, the attackers are going to look for the easiest way in. They don't wanna do more work than they have to in order to breach a system. And data breaches keep on happening. There are all sorts of different reports out there. 81% of data breaches involve weak credentials, you know, ABC123, Viva uh, Juventus, all whatever it is. 70% uh, compromised devices, you know, not patched to current or N minus one. This is a problem that keeps coming up. In one company I worked at, we did a complete scan of all the laptops and desktops in our environment in addition to the servers. Before I had arrived at that company the week earlier, no one had ever done that before. So all the servers were in pretty bad shape, but all the laptops and desktops were worse. The best laptop in the entire environment only had 267 high-risk vulnerabilities on it. That was my laptop, and that's only because I'd been at the company for a week. And no, I had no way to patch it myself. 
So we have to look at strategies and how we're going to improve things. Zero trust is something that comes up a lot, and this is not a product. This is not a solution per se, it's a strategy. It's about reducing risk in your environment and doing it incrementally. So making sure that you can get back to those core fundamentals that we should have been looking at 30 years ago. Making security part of your mission as well and building it into the culture is another thing too. Uh, one of my colleagues, he just did a poll uh, at a conference he was at and he just said, okay, here's a web link, go check out this poll and tell me what is your biggest issue? Hands down, the biggest issue that they highlighted was how to build a security culture in their organization. So that's pretty telling that it was a, such a large percentage of the users that you know, had that as an issue. So if you can build security into the mission of your organization, enable people to understand that they are part of the solution and empower them to do something about it, this will go a long way. Because when we're looking at environments far too often, it's been bailing wire and duct tape that's holding everything together. I've worked in organizations where we had a, what's called a Shiva dialer. It's a dial-up system that we use the VPN in. The architect bought it on eBay and deployed it without looking at anything. It had the original config from the previous owner. Silly things like this happen far, far too often. So when you're looking at security in your organization, you have to make sure you have a plan. How are you going to do a better job if you don't know what it is you're trying to protect? You want to go through and do a quick little shopping list. Look at the users in your environment. Evaluate the devices. Make sure you have secure connections to your applications. You don't want to have open connections. That, there's no reason I should be sitting in a coffee shop here in Rome and being able to attach to somebody's email in the United States because it just happens to be there. It should be able to be you know, proxy and protected and using multi-factor authentication all the rest of it. These two are a constant drive Dave crazy thing. Sanitize your inputs and sanitize your outputs on all of your applications. This SQL injection has been on the OAuth top 10 since the beginning and is still there. In my previous role, every quarter, we would look at how many attacks involved SQL injection. Hands down, it was the top vector that attackers were using to try and breach systems every single quarter. And patching your systems, while that seems trite to just say it, I know it's not as easy as just patch it, but you have to make sure you have some sort of coherent solution that you can go through and look at how you're going to vet patches as they come in, have compensating controls to buy you time until you can apply those patches, do your regression testing to make sure, I don't know, they work, um, because not all patches work. <laughs> so zero trust is really a really simple way to look at it. The easiest way to get into it is looking at it from the perspective of multi-factor authentication. And no, I'm not pushing product. This is any product out there can do this. Establish trust in user identities. Who is it that's coming through the front door? What is your source of truth? Is it Active Directory? Is it Workday? What are you using for that? Look at the uh, trustworthiness of the user devices. Have they been patched since you know 2008? There's a problem. Enforce policies at the user device combination. If I'm working for your company here in Rome, and I just happen to pop up from South Africa and there's no reason I'd ever be in South Africa, you should be able to actually control that. Making sure you have secure connections to all your applications, and then once you have that, looking at all the data and going through it and seeing what is actually supposed to be happening. You have to have that visibility to have a better uh, secure posture for your organization. And unfortunately, I put this slide in here too, so it's more of the same. I'll just skip through it. Heaven forbid I pay attention. Now, WebAuthN. How many people have heard of WebAuthN? Well, you got homework. WebAuthN is part of an open standard that was published by the W3C. This is an open standard. I talked about this years ago in front of an audience in uh, Singapore, and they thought I was selling a product. This is an open standard. This is a foundational element for what's called passwordless authentication. This is a better way to handle authentication, so you are making it easier for the end users. Get away from passwords. Make sure that you can do it in such a way that is going to better secure your environment. Now, we do a couple of reports at Cisco that are completely not product related. And when you go through it and you look at some of this, this one here is called, oh God, what's it called? Uh, Security Outcome Study. When we looked at it, we looked at you know, how often organizations are refreshing their environment. Obviously, this is only going to be applicable to organizations that can afford to do it this way. But they found that you know, security and IT were hand in hand as they went through the process. 
And we went, looked at the upgrade strategies and looked at different organizations. This is about 6,000 different organizations we talked to. The best part about this report, I should have pointed out at the beginning, is this is a double blind study. So none of the people that we were talking to knew they were talking to us at Cisco. So we found that the ones that had um, their organizational refresh handled by a vendor, they had 65.7% of them had a better security posture than the others that were trying to manage it themselves. Having managed environments over the years too many times to care to mention, I understand this all too well because there are only so many hours in the day. And ease of integration is hands down the number one criteria for organizations getting solutions. So we want to make sure we're not giving them tools written by engineers for engineers and that is something that's easy to use. Now this is a report that I have written for the last couple of years called the Trusted Access Report. We went through all the authentications for Duo and looked at the trending analysis here. And this, this past year, which came out in November, we went through 13.5 billion different authentications over the course of a year. We also went out and looked at it over time from April 2019, and we noticed that there was a huge dip from April 20, April 2020 rather, right through until recently where authentication sort of dropped off, and we realized that was because of the pandemic. I talked to many organizations that what they did was they just grabbed desktops or laptops and gave them to their staff, sent them home, and tried to do things as easy as possible so they could keep the lights on. The problem here is a lot of these organizations have to make sure they go back and ensure that they haven't left themselves in undue exposure. The other piece too is countries over, uh, over the world, all over, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. come on brain, work. Countries all over the world have different ways that they approach things from perspective of their devices count. So for example, here in Italy, do, 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 on average we have three devices per person in this country, which is, a lot. My, my daughter has more, but that's, <laughs> that's one of those things. So there are three different pl places there where an attacker could conceivably go after an individual. And if they're not patched to kernel in minus one, you're going to have problems. And browsers are another real huge problem. Uh, as we've seen too many times over the years, if your browser is open to an attack, like cross-site scripting, all the rest of it, I have a bunch of CVs for that nonsense. Um, when we look at education, hands down, they have more varieties of browsers, and that makes sense because in an educational institution, they are going to do whatever they're going to do because professors are going to be professors. But if you look in financial services, they will tend to have a squeak down so that they have a better control over their environment. And this is one of those things where you look at it, it's like, how do we do a better job for education so that they are sure that they have some level of security that they're contending with? Oh yeah, and Java is still very much out there. Not as bad as this though. Uh, we went through the authentication for 13.5 billion records and we found some folks that were still using Flash. Okay, for those of you who may not know, Flash is gone, even Adobe has killed it, it's been gone for a while. If you find this in your environment, kill it with fire. So what we have to do is look at how do we democratize security in our organizations? Because people are very good at what they're very good at. If it's, if it's, if it's um, handling finance and HR, things like that, they don't want to have to know what to do and from a security perspective. We need to make it as easy as possible for them. So we have to give them tools that are going to keep them secure, but also be very easy for them to use. Would you ever get your parents to use PGP? Exactly. I would never get my mother to use PGP because I just like to get, you know, invited to dinner once in a while. And that's nothing against PGP. I love the tool, but it is not user friendly in any way, shape, or form. You want to build your systems to fail. And what I mean by that is when they do fail, how are they going to react? How are you going to be sure that systems are going to still run even though things have gone down? We used to hear, you know, five nines and all that sort of thing. And that still left a large chunk of space where systems could be completely offline. In today's day and age, with all the various different kinds of cloud computing platforms, all the different security tools, you know, Cisco, CrowdStrike, whatever it happens to be, you have the ability to make sure that your systems stay up. So 5.9 is really is a bit of a fallacy. You want to make sure your systems are resilient. <coughs> Can they take a punch? Do you have some sort of CDN that is working to protect you as well? You have to look at all these different ways because the attackers will come at you any way they can in order to steal from you. We want to make sure that we're not making their job any easier. You want to look at building out a zero trust framework. And what I mean by that is simply this, reducing risk in your environment. It's not that hard. 
I've seen too many times where people give a zero talk, zero, sorry, zero trust talk, and they say, oh, it's only this, or it's only that, or if you buy this box with the blinky lights. No, just risk reduction. There are tools out there that can help you get it done, but risk reduction. <coughs> so when you're looking at talking about zero trust, and what I when I talk about this, it's a way to help you have those compensating controls so that you can improve the security of your environment. Make sure you have a clear asset inventory. Do you know the users in your environment? One company I worked at a long time ago, which will remain nameless, I was there for two weeks. We did a complete assessment of all the uh, super user accounts. There were 10 super user accounts there that belonged to people that were no longer with the organization. One person's account had been used in the last two years. That person has been dead for five months. <laughs> These are not the kind of things you want to see in your logs. Thankfully, we found out it was just something very benign and we were able to disable that, but yes. Device management, define repeatable processes. You don't need a vendor for that. That is a way to reduce risk in your organization that any organization can do now. If you have a defined repeatable process, practice it, test it, make sure that you know how it works and keep iterating through. Network zone segmentation, and I don't know why I said helmets for guards. Apparently I was drinking at the time I did the slides. <laughs> It is a good practice though, make sure you have a helmet. Because often we see the world like this. And as security practitioners, as we saw earlier, and I, I, forgive me, I'm not sure who had the showdown slide in their the talk, but yeah, showdown is super entertaining if you're not familiar with it. If you are, if you're not familiar with showdown.io as a website, damn, it's amazing what you can find on there. And the law of unintended consequences. One company I was working at, we found that our entire fabrication facility was on showdown at that point in time. We got it fixed really quickly, but that's a lot of unintended consequences is that we try to do these things and sometimes we miss pieces. We don't look where we should be looking and we have to constantly keep our head on the swivel because bad things are going to happen. This was because of a vulnerability that we had all known about for 10 years. 10 years. We can do better. We often worry about the security threats. We look at sharks everywhere, but we get stuck in a loop. I know I've done this way too many times in my career. The lessons learned are that we have to make sure that we are communicating what we find, communicating what we go through. A lot of the reason that I like giving talks about things like this is that I can share the lessons learned and the stupid things I've done, and hopefully it'll help somebody else along the way. Because we often worry about the sharks, but we never pay attention to the ocean. We got to do a better job of having a much more coherent view of what our security issues are that we're facing. We have to look at the power of trust. If we're looking at interconnected systems, if one thing goes wrong and everything drops, for example, uh, Omar reminded me uh, quite inadvertently during his talk about one system that, uh, don't do this, but I scanned an HMI system with a, a, a SIM scan with NMAP. It dropped it, the lock D, this one. The lock D locked up and it was a cascade failure and almost took the entire power system down for the problems. Yeah, that was not fun. So you want to make sure that you have resilience built in so that things like that don't happen and don't let Dave scan your stuff. And the best part about this is things like this event here. Having this community, having things like this, and I really hope this is going to keep coming back year after year because this is where you get to share stories. This is where you get to interact with each other. This sense of community is something that we have to do a much better job of building out. We're doing a great job in security, but we can do better. We can always do better. So make sure that this keeps going. We can grow. Now we wanna make sure that we're building that safe and secure future, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. Make sure that you are thinking things, thinking things through having a coherent strategy as you approach things, and don't just go flying around with your hair on fire. I've done it too many times. I'm surprised I still have hair. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much to B-Size Rome. I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, grazie mille. Bene, eccoci qui dopo 
questo speech devo dire è intrigante nel senso che è stato molto accattivante nei modi no? il nostro amico sì, sì, canadese sì, sì. ci ha dimostrato no, fantastico cioè già dalla presentazione cioè, sua, il Vuemai è stato Vuemai veramente il più geniale. bello che ho visto sì, oggi sì, è stato sì, davvero sì, bello sì. durante eh, le slide sì, la slide con Devo Bell sì ah, sì sì, sì, sì è assolutamente Assolutamente un point, mettiamolo così, è veramente Assolutamente rappresentato, sì. è stato proprio il, il, come dire, il wrap up di tutto, di tutto oggi, Claudio. No, davvero, okay. davvero molto interessante. E in realtà ci per questo speak ci avviciniamo alla fine perché se non sbaglio è l'ultimo speak non vorrei, non vorrei sbagliarmi perché è saltato uno speak e perché abbiamo eh, fondamentalmente lo speak finale più una piccola sorpresa per i nostri spettatori no? abbiamo una round table con il pubblico e quindi questo ci permetterà anche di eh, interagire un pochino di vedere un attimino come, eh, come il nostro pubblico reagisce alla, alla conferenza